Good morning. I'm Tom Mann, a senior fellow, as I have been for many years here at Brookings, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this wonderful event. Our divided political heart, the battle for, for the American idea in an age of discontent, a conversation with E.J. Dion. I can tell you it is always rewarding and fun to have a conversation with E.J. And that's what uh, awaits us over, over the next 90 minutes. Let me uh, make note of the fact that this is being live webcast and as I have been briefed countless times, you all dispose, at least those disposed to tweet um, are encouraged to do so. Uh, the hashtag is the pound sign D-I-V-H-E-A-R-T, -E and there it is right there. Thank you for that cue. I'm, God, I'm, it's seamless, isn't it, uh, the way I handle these things? Uh, it's just, uh, it is just amazing. It gives me uh, such pleasure to be in the role of uh, moderating this session on EJ's new book. I was thinking about him and how to introduce him this morning, and I decided since, since he is a baseball fan and has a son uh, who is an accomplished baseball player uh, up at Harvard now, uh, that uh, that he should be described as the consensus winner each year of the MVP award in, in our business. Uh, and that business is, uh, covers, uh, covers a lot of ground. Uh, to remind those of you who, uh, who aren't as close and familiar with EJ as many of us in the room are, he's a summa grad of Harvard, a, a Rhodes Scholar, and has a PhD albeit in political sociology from the University of, uh, of Oxford. He was a reporter for the New York Times for 14 years, uh, covering everything from state politics in Albany to, uh, uh, to Rome and Paris and the Middle East, uh, Lebanon in particular. Went to work for the Washington Post as a reporter, but became a columnist uh, uh, in about 1993, his syndicated column, at last count, had 144 newspapers, and it's probably increased since, uh, uh, since I looked. But alas, that in no way captures uh, what EJ does for a living. Uh, he also happens to be a uh, senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, where he has been and is involved in a myriad of of projects covering the media, religion, uh, and American politics more generally. Did I mention he's also a university professor at Georgetown University? He is an official pundit um, at NPR, MSNBC, and Meet the Press. He's author and editor of, or editor of numerous books uh, uh, I will mention here only his first and his latest. Uh, the first also won an award for the best title. In addition to that, uh, was a, a bestseller and won LA Times uh, Book Award, uh, National Book Award. Uh, he was also a nominee um, uh, for other awards. It's, it's called Why Americans Hate Politics. Um, must be the best title of any book I've, uh, I've come upon. E.J. now, um, after, uh, after all these years since the publication of uh, that first book, has, has in some sense come home, returned to uh, uh, his great interest in, in American political history, in, in public philosophy, uh, the importance of of ideas uh, and and his efforts to link these these broad perspectives with contemporary American politics, he's done it um, in our divided political heart. It is indeed a fascinating uh, book. I got to read it 
before you all uh, have uh, every word of it and, uh, and just enjoyed it immensely as, as you will hear what EJ has done has reminded us that, that uh, the American idea has always involved a balance between individualism and, and community. But alas, uh, there is an imbalance in, uh, in our system uh, these days, and, and EJ uh, 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 conveys that uh, as, uh, as thoroughly and as richly as anyone could possibly do. In fact, it's so magnetic, the whole idea of these, the tension between these two that EJ had just written a piece in Sunday Outlook section about it, um, and on a Sunday morning news show, Senator Richard Lugar uh, explained that, in fact, the problem with the Republican Party is they've forgotten the second part of it, the community, and, and have emphasized individualism. So footnotes aren't even necessary at this stage. He's already gotten his ideas into into uh, the public domain. I didn't mention perhaps the most important uh, thing about E.J., which is that he is the most wonderful, lovely human being uh, perhaps uh, any of us, certainly me, have, uh, have encountered in these years. And I'm delighted to, uh, uh, to give him the floor. I love Tom Mann right back. He is one of the greatest people I have ever met. And I've said when we did an event for Tom's book that probably the most constructive thing I did to tell people about my book was to write a long quotation on the back of Tom's great book. Uh, it's even worse than it looks. Um, and, um, I, you know, so that it, you have every reason to doubt political pundits. Uh, but uh, I saw how important Norm and Tom's book would be long before they wrote their Outlook piece. Some people in the room are old enough to remember those buttons after Gene McCarthy did well in New Hampshire for McCarthy before New Hampshire. I was for Mann and Ornstein before their Outlook piece, and I'm very, very proud of that. I also want to thank all the, all the people at Brookings who helped organize this event, and I particularly want to thank them because I've always wanted a hashtag. Uh, I've never had a hashtag before, and I had the uh, funniest experience this weekend. For, because of this book, I finally decided that I had to stop being a troglodyte and discover uh, social media. So I am now on Twitter and also tending my Facebook account. And my wife and I went to uh, New York uh, to see Death of a Salesman, the matinee, with, which is fantastic, by the way. I commend it. To this uh, performance of Death of a Salesman is really extraordinary. Um, and our train was late, so we got to bed at uh, quarter to two. And I found myself waking up at 11 o'clock the next morning. 11 o'clock, I hadn't slept till uh, to 11 o'clock since our children were born, and my son is almost 20. And so I came downstairs and I said, I'm a teenager again. I'm on Facebook, I'm tweeting, and I woke up at 11 in the morning, and I only wish my joints felt as uh, I was uh, behaving. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, our divided uh, uh, political heart. Um, I, incidentally, I know there are a number of teachers uh, in the room, and I just want to say that the book, I have two dedications to the book, one to my family, but the other um, is to a whole lot of teachers who are very important to me. And the first three are actually high school teachers, two American history teachers I had, and also my English teacher who, by giving me a very, very low grade on a paper I wrote about the death penalty, uh, inspired me to want to learn how to write so I wouldn't have to uh, uh, confront this uh, again. And the, these, uh, these teachers were very important to me, so I want to commend all the teachers who are in the room here um, today. Um, but this book does come out of a love of the American story and of American history. Uh, and there's a kind of paradox in the book because the first sentence of the book refers to American decline, uh, but the book is very distinctly not a declinist book. It's actually a hopeful book uh, about our future. Indeed, I note in talking about decline uh, that we have this conversation about decline over and over again. 
which actually is a sign of what a high opinion we actually have of our country, because we always think we're in a place from which uh, we can uh, decline. Um, and the core argument of our book is, of, uh, of the book, uh, is that the way we will avoid decline is to refresh our traditional balance, our traditional balance being a balance um, a, a between our love of individualism and our deep affection for uh, and quest for community. Um, out of decline have come um, uh, some extraordinary politicians and some extraordinary political campaigns. I think Barack Obama's election, in fact, uh, uh, was very much rooted in a sense that he was the person to solve a kind of spiritual crisis that accompanies decline. Because I think when we go through these declinist periods, we initially locate the trouble in particular foreign policy or economic difficulties, which we certainly had galore in 2010. But then we flip it very quickly uh, into a, uh, a spiritual crisis. And we start asking the core question, which we've already heard a lot in this campaign, and I think we'll hear right to the end, who, uh, who are we? Uh, that, th that debates during periods of decline are about who we are. We reach back into our history uh, for, uh, for enlightenment in that way. Um, and I wrote this book partly inspired by uh, the Tea Party. Um, and the book is very critical of the Tea Party's view of our history. Um, but I think the Tea Party was right to go back to the origins of the country, and we need to have the argument with them. And I think that many on the progressive side, uh, though not my friend Lane Windham, who is in uh, uh, grad school studying history, uh, but many on the progressive side have kind of left the historical argument uh, to our conservative friends. Uh, why should our conservative friends be the only people who carry around copies of the Constitution uh, in their pocket? Why do we leave quoting the Federalist uh, to uh, conservatives? Why do we leave the Declaration uh, to them? The most forward-looking uh, politicians uh, and moral spokesmen in our history did not do that. Uh, I commend to everybody going back to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. The entire first part of that speech is about the promises uh, that the United States made to its people uh, for equality uh, under law. And Dr. King spoke of a promissory note that had been given to African Americans that had come back uh, in unpaid, insufficient funds. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's most important political speech before he was president was his speech at Cooper Union, uh, where he went back and made an argument that the founders ultimately foresaw, as he did, um, the extinction of slavery uh, in the United States. And Lincoln did months of historical research to give the speech that uh, the historian Harold Holzer thinks made him president, got him the Republican nomination and made him president. So my core argument is that we are torn by this healthy tension uh, between our love of individualism and our affection for community. Um, and I think we have too often, especially in recent uh, years, told our story almost entirely uh, on the individualistic side. Uh, we have emphasized uh, individual liberty uh, to the exclusion of our dedication to community and also equality, which we argue about um, in every generation. Um, so I like to remind everybody that the very first word of the Constitution of the United States, it's not I, it's not individual, it's not liberty, it's we. The first word of the American Constitution in the preamble is we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic uh, tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. Yes, welfare is in the first paragraph of the American Constitution, and secure the blessings of liberty uh, to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. Um, the Declaration of Independence, I like to argue, is a perfect reflection of this balance between individualism and community, because we're all familiar uh, with the beginning uh, and, and the commitment to uh, our inalienable rights that come from our creator, that among these being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and uh, that is sort of part of our individualistic nature. But in the very last paragraph, of the Declaration of Independence, um, where the founders pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. They understood that we cannot protect individual liberty unless we act together. Uh, you and I must come to the defense of each other's 
uh, liberty in order to preserve it. And so this is necessarily a communal project we are engaged in. And if you actually care about liberty, you've got to care about the well-being of the community. Now, we're, we've had a parallel argument, particularly uh, in uh, recent years, um, uh, related to the role of government in our history. And I had a lot of fun in this book uh, going back through the legacies of uh, Hamilton and Clay and, and Abraham Lincoln, um, and then also the populist and progressive uh, legacies. Um, if you believe that the federal government played a uh, little role in the development of our country, you have to write, among others, Hamilton, Clay, and Lincoln out of the national uh, story entirely. Um, in f if you believe that the Constitution is absolutely clear and can be read only one way, then you have to deal with the fact that within three years of the enactment of the federal Constitution, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, two leading interpreters of it in the Federalists, were at each other's throats over whether the federal government had a right to establish a bank uh, of the United States. My chapter on the Constitution is called One Nation Conceived in Argument. Uh, and I, um, f I uh, couldn't resist quoting my friend, the legal scholar Garrett Epps, who said that uh, Justice Scalia and other originalists uh, root their jurisprudence in the idea that I knew the founders, that the founders were friends of mine. I know how they'd think. Uh, and I argue that this approach to constitutionalism uh, is inadequate. I even challenge uh, the originalists on originalist grounds, for those of you who are interested in uh, some, of these, uh, some of these matters. Um, but the Hamilton and Clay were visionaries. They were advocates of what might be seen as national planning. Uh, Henry Clay, for example, um, had a bold program that he called the American system. And what's intriguing about this is that he called it the American system to distinguish it from the British system, which he said was rooted in laissez-faire economics. The American system, as conceived by Clay, was an alternative to pure laissez-faire because he believed that government had a major role to play um, first, in building our country, he wanted the federal government to help a lot with internal improvements, bridges, canals, roads. What a much better word than infrastructure, by the way. Could we please start talking about internal improvements instead of infrastructure? Um, but he also saw, like Hamilton did, uh, a role for the federal government in building us up as a manufacturing uh, nation. And, when, and, by the way, he came up with revenue sharing uh, long before Richard Nixon uh, did uh, because he wanted to give aid to the states to do a lot of the projects that he felt needed to be done uh, to uh, build up the country. Um, in frustration once when his opponents were saying his program was unconstitutional, uh, and in particular his effort to help American manufacturing was unconstitutional, he said, do we live in the only country in the world with a constitution that is written for other countries but not for ourself? And so like many progressives, including FDR, uh, in later years, Clay and others express frustration with those who see the constitution not is a liberating document to encourage self-government, but as a series of chains uh, designed to keep our country in exactly the same condition it was in 1787. I don't think that's how the founders themselves thought. That's not how we should think about it. Um, just a couple of other historical points, and I'll close so we can go to the uh, Q&A. Um, I, uh, I argue that our friends in the Tea Party are looking back to an exceptional period uh, in our history as typical, um, that there was one period when um, the uh, when a kind of radical individualism, which I argue is where uh, the creed that contemporary conservatives in this narrow era, really starting with the election or the end of the Bush years and the beginning of the Ob Barack Obama's term, uh, radical individualism really triumphed only in the period of the Gilded Age, in the sort of 35 years from uh, the end of the Civil War to, I'd argue, the ascension of Theodore Roosevelt uh, to the uh, White House. Um, and this uh, radical individualism had an enormous effect. It had a great effect on the Supreme Court uh, and its decisions. It's in that period where corporations were declared people, my friend, if I may quote uh, Mr. Romney. Uh, and it's uh, also uh, in that period, in the, the aftermath of that period, uh, that the famous Lochner decision was made. That was in 1905, blowback from the long 
individualist period, which said the federal government couldn't regulate uh, the hours of uh, uh, workers. Um, and I argue that the populists and the progressives who are seen by our conservative friends, and particularly our Tea Party friends, as interlopers, were actually restoring the longer American tradition of balance that dominated uh, for 235 years. Herbert Crowley, the great progressive thinker who influenced uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, uh, argued that progressives sought to use Hamiltonian means to serve Jeffersonian ends. They wanted to use an active federal government uh, in order to ensure greater equality of opportunity and uh, an economy not dominated by the trusts or by a very small number of people. Um, by the way, those who are looking for uh, encouragement in our current debates can go back to some of the things that both Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson said about trusts and concentrated economic power. And Roosevelt and Wilson sound like people hanging out at Occupy Wall Street encampments. It's really quite astonishing how uh, strongly their, how strong their rhetoric was about the dangers of concentrated economic power. And that's the other part of the American balance. If <coughs> we have always sought a balance between individualism and community, we have seen a balance between the state and the market. We have indeed seen government and the market sphere and the independent third sector as partners, not just as adversaries. Um, and that we have used government to check concentrated private power, even as we have used constitutional means to check untrammeled government power. And again, it's a, a series of balances. We balance the state, uh, the local, and the national. Um, and I think we are groping back toward that kind of balance now. Um, I want to thank, by the way, my friend uh, David Brooks. Uh, some of you, if you've read David's column this morning, he kindly mentioned my book and called it engrossing. And uh, if you're going to have a word with gross in it, that's the one you want applied uh, to your book. So God bless uh, David for uh, that. Um, and incidentally, he also plugged Mike Lynn's book. And Mike is a really important figure. I'm glad he, uh, he plugged Mike, even though he disagreed with both of us. And I just want to take David up on two of our areas of disagreement and then uh, close. Um, he, he summarizes me well enough, and then he takes issue. He says that uh, E.J. Dion, my pundit, uh, NPR pundit partner, I like that pundit partner, argues that the Hamiltonian and Jacksonian traditions form part of a balanced consensus which has been destroyed by the radical individualists of today's Republican Party. That is what I believe. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, then he goes on to say, but that balance governing philosophy was destroyed gradually over the 20th century before the Tea Party was even in utero. As government excessively overreached, Republicans became excessively anti-government. And I guess the question I want to ask David and Will on a blog is, where exactly has government overreached? I don't think David wants to repeal uh, environmental or consumer protection laws. I don't think David believes that we do not need to regulate the securities markets, uh, particularly after what happened in 2008. Maybe he doesn't believe we should provide a prescription drug benefit under Medicare, although I believe we do. Uh, in other words, I find I sort of fundamentally disagree that what government has done in the New Deal and the progressive to New Deal to Great Society period to now uh, represents some kind of some set of chains on the economy. Indeed, in this period, as government has grown, in many ways, individual liberty uh, grew. As government grew, upward mobility increased. Uh, as government grew, more Americans got educated. Uh, now, I quite agree with him. There are better and worse ways to uh, do government. Uh, we progressives are not in the business of expanding government uh, for government's sake. Um, but I think the <coughs> rise of radical individualism comes not primarily from government overreaching, but from a reaction to President Bush where conservatives could not argue that he failed because he was too conservative and so had to argue that he failed because he was too much uh, in favor of big government. The other thing David writes is, does government nurture an enterprising citizenry or a secure but less energetic one? Um, and I would again challenge my friend David uh, on the whole idea that being secure makes you less energetic. Uh, I think uh, most, if there are psychologists in the room, they can correct me, but we generally think that when people are secure, uh, they become more energetic. They have more opportunity 
uh, to act in ways that serve themselves, their families, uh, and their communities. I was struck some years ago when I got this awesome tour of the Silicon Valley uh, and visited a lot of entrepreneurs and the like. I decided in that period that I would not, I would view my column from that point forward as a nice little startup. Uh, and, um, but something somebody, what, what struck me is that security was at the heart of the entrepreneurial world of Silicon Valley. Uh, because people could take great risks because they knew that if their risks failed, there was something underneath them. Uh, all these great engineers could quickly find employment for a while while they concocted their next new idea. And I mentioned this to someone uh, in the Valley uh, who said, yes, yeah, some people have a safety net, we have a safety network. And so <coughs> I don't believe that, <coughs> I'm sorry, I picked up a coal with yapping about this book too much over the last week. Uh, I don't believe that security is the enemy of energy or entrepreneurship, but can actually be a con commitment to it. Um, so I just want to close this way. I said the book uh, is anti-declinist, and it is. Um, I believe that our history shows us that we are looking uh, for balance as a country. And what's wrong with our politics right now is that one party to the argument really wants to, I think, destroy and replace this traditional uh, American balance. And I think we need... Uh, to defend it. It is that balance, I believe, that created uh, what we came to call uh, the, American, uh, the American century. And um, in writing this book and reflecting on American history, um, it came to me more and more uh, that being an American uh, is a privilege, uh, but it's also an obligation. Uh, when you look at those founding documents and what they were trying to create, when you look at our founders who were not reactionaries, but were extraordinarily adventurous people creating a constitutional republic at a moment when most of the world felt the constitutional republics could not work, particularly in an area as large as that of the United States. Our founders handed us uh, a promise that we had to keep. Um, and our history has been a history of the steady uh, expansion of democracy from the very beginning of our republic. Um, we began fighting with each other uh, and ultimately uh, uh, fighting with each other over how democratic our nation would be. And the small d Democrats won fight after fight after fight. We first expanded the uh, franchise from property owners uh, to all white men. We eventually uh, expanded <coughs> the franchise to African Americans after the Civil War, took it away, but then we gave it we finally, after years of struggle, uh, returned the franchise to African Americans. We extended the franchise uh, to women. We created much more uh, a broad uh, economic opportunity. And I think that different part, uh, partners in the argument uh, helped us on this. If the Whigs and the Hamiltonians helped us in understanding the importance of a strong federal government, the Jeffersonians and the Jacksonians reminded us of the importance of equality uh, and uh, democracy. Um, so we, yes, we have an obligation uh, to avoid American decline, but above all, we have an obligation uh, to the promise of liberty, of community, uh, and of equality uh, that is written at the, at the, it was written for us at the very beginning of our national story. I believe the new generation that is rising up um, is unusually well suited to keep uh, this promise. It's middle-aged or older people like to think we're the ones who are balanced. Actually, it's the younger generation right now who have things uh, in balance. In some ways, they are both the most individualistic and the most communitarian uh, generation uh, in our history. Um, they are the ones more comfortable with technology than those of us who come to Twitter at age 60. Uh, yet, they quickly form social uh, networks. Uh, they are the ones who are accustomed to the entrepreneurial society in which we live. Yet they are also the generation that has given more time to service uh, than uh, any other that has come along uh, for a long time. And that is not just, as cynics might say, because they had to do so in high school or because they wanted to get into college. Uh, in fact, once you begin to serve, this transforms uh, individuals. And this has been a generation that has been transformed uh, and could be transformative. Uh, so I believe that we will keep the American promise, and my book is an attempt to, to remind us of a, uh, of a bold history and of the fact that we are a very interesting people, not dominated by a single idea,
but by a set of concerns uh, that we know we must uh, uphold together. And so I thank you all for coming. And I thank Tom for moderating this. And let's have it out about our nation and its future. Thank you so much. I just want you to know I kept looking at my grad school friend, Lane, and when she was nodding, I felt I had the approval of a learning graduate student. So thank you. It's, uh, it's always encouraging when you're up on that podium. <laughs> Uh, I get to pose a few questions uh, to EJ that he hasn't seen and has no idea of. And then, uh, Are you now or have you ever been a member of? No, no, he doesn't do that. <laughs> then we will turn to you as well as to those uh, here uh, 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 virtually. Uh, EJ, I too read David's uh, column with, uh, with great interest. and noted his, his determination to deny progressives and liberals the link to Hamilton, Clay, and Lincoln. They were into national banks, internal improvements, uh, land-grant colleges to, to really assist agriculture, uh, but not all that other stuff. Um, yet I recall reading in your book that there was a lot of other stuff going on from the very beginning of the republic that government, uh, in which government played a role in what might be called the social safety net now. Oh, well, thank you for that question. First, let me say a couple of things. David is a real friend. It's not just <laughs> that we pretend to be on the radio. I really like David a lot. And actually, when I finished this book, I told him that doing the book was worth it, if only for one thing, which is that I finally figured out why David was so crosswise to contemporary politics because he is the last surviving, thoroughgoing American Whig. Uh, and if you want to, and I, I meant that, and he took it as a compliment. Uh, because if you want to understand David, you really should go back to Hamilton Clay uh, and Lincoln. And I think that is where David is coming from. And I am very proud of the fact that my book is probably the only book in a long time other than Jeffrey uh, Cabba Service's yeah. book on moderate Republicans, in which Jacob Javits plays uh, an important role. I was, um, I was much taken many years ago by a book Javits wrote in 1964 called Order of Battle, where he was arguing that Republicans are actually the party of small-d democratic nationalism. And he talked about the ancestors of the Republican Party, and he invoked uh, uh, Hamilton, Clay, uh, Lincoln, and uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I should also note that no one other than the president of the Osawatomi, Kansas Chamber of Commerce was as excited as I was when President Obama gave that Osawatomi speech uh, in honor of the speech Teddy Roosevelt gave in 1910, because I had wanted President Obama to give a speech like that for a long time, so I was uh, uh, grateful for that. Um, but I, uh, here's where I think David's right and here's where I think he's wrong. He's right that it is a mistake for liberals to pretend that Hamilton and Clay are liberals. We liberals like to invoke them on behalf of national action, and the Whigs deserve better than they've gotten because they were also uh, advocates of uh, far better treatment uh, for the mentally infirm and insane. They were advocates of public schooling. Um, they really were forward-looking in so many uh, ways, but they were also, in certain ways, fundamentally conservative. They did see themselves uh, as serving the interests of a certain part of the uh, upper class. I, I, I doubt that uh, uh, Whigs would be comfortable with some of the directions that American liberalism has taken. But I am grateful that you asked the question because um, I think David is wrong in not uh, trying, in suggesting um, that um, there wasn't any social welfare uh, inherent in the early American Republic. The, favorite fact I learned, uh, well, one of my favorite facts I learned in writing this book um, was from a great book I commend to you by Brian Baylaw called The Government Out of Sight. He's a historian at the University of Virginia. And I had never known uh, that it's, it's a sort of a quiz. When do you think the very first federal health care program was enacted? Uh, just think about your answer. The answer is in 1798. 1798, uh, uh, I guess uh, 10 years after the adoption of the Constitution, uh, John Adams created the National 
health system for sick and injured seamen. I want to go back and look at what it was about uh, people on boats that got the uh, Congress's attention. But we essentially had socialized medicine for seamen back in 1898. Uh, jump forward. 1798. Uh, 1798, <laughs> thank you. Um, and as I wrote in the Outlook piece yesterday, I do not recall a mass rallies against Adams Care uh, back in uh, 1798. Jump forward to the period uh, after the Civil War, and a great political writer, Theodore Scotchpole, has called people's attention to this some years ago. Uh, the uh, federal Civil War uh, pension program was vast. Uh, it consumed, I believe, if I remember right, uh, in 1794, it consumed 37% of the federal budget. Now, that's an entitlement uh, program. It uh, served at its peak 28% of American families, uh, or I think it was American men. Uh, but later it was extended uh, to families. So we have had, uh, and I don't know what you call the Homestead Act, but that was a big government giveaway of land so that people could come uh, and own their own land. Um, and land-grant colleges are an interesting case where I think David and I very much agree. On the one hand, they are very much part of that build the country up tradition of Clay and Hamilton that David and I both like. Um, but this also created a very large public benefit. Again, it allowed uh, lots of Americans who did not, uh, in the interior, who did not have access to higher education to have access to higher education. And without that original law, some of our greatest state universities might not exist. So I do think, I don't draw quite the same clear line as David does between these two, uh, you know, the, between the liberal tradition or the progressive tradition in Hamilton and Clay even though he is right to remind us that they are not identical. Now I'd like to fast forward to the last couple of uh, decades. Uh, decades, uh, a time period, say, when Robert Nisbet was writing A Quest for Community, but Ayn Rand was, uh, was also out there as sort of popularizing libertarian ideas. Uh, so the, Nisbet, Nisbet spoke for the conservatives, in many respect Republicans, yet now his ideas have seemingly been abandoned by conservatives and Republicans. Why? What happened? How do you account for it? The um, Nisbet, uh, for those of you who have never read him, the, the best way to get at Nisbet is a great book of essays called Tradition and Revolt, uh, which is a good summary of, it's a, a collection of essays that is a good summary of where he was uh, coming from. He was at AEI for a number of years. Um, it's interesting, I got to know him. He was somebody I ran across in college and really got to like, even though I was not on the right side of the political spectrum. And I got to meet him. Uh, and the, he, he said the great irony is the new left, which he strenuously opposed, brought the quest for community back into print. Uh, it, it had been published in 1952, had gone out of print. Uh, and because of the new left's interest in participatory democracy uh, and community, the early statement of the new left, the Port Huron statement, is still, I believe, a fascinating uh, document um, before the new left kind of went nuts. Um, it was sort of rep reflected the deeply democratic uh, nature of the early part of that movement. And they were the people who got Nismet back into print, which he was always amused, uh, <laughs> amused yeah. by. Um, you know, and Nisbet is also, a, a, he's a kind of historical sociologist, and he makes the case that conservatism at the beginning was actually a revolt against liberal notions of community. It was a revolt against individualism, that uh, conservatives posited the importance of family and status and traditional uh, community, but also, he wrote, that society is prior to the individual, which is quite the opposite of what Mrs. Thatcher said uh, there is no such thing as society. Um, and I think that what you've seen is more and more conservatives certainly are uncomfortable with the idea of the centrality of society, um, but also um, of community as a defining characteristic of conservatism. Now again, in fairness, there's a wonderful guy in town called Bill Shambra who is sort of the, in some ways, he and Mike Gerson are among the last of the true communitarian uh, conservatives. Um, and there is a debate among progressives like me and conservatives like Bill Shambra about the role of federal and national action in fostering a uh, community. I believe with Theda Scotchpole and others that actually the federal government 
uh, far from simply sapping the power of local communities, as my friend Bill Chamber would argue. I believe the federal government has often empowered uh, local communities. Scotch Pole uses a great example of the GI Bill, which was lobbied for by the American Legion and whose enactment strengthened the American Legion organization uh, around the country. And, and you can see a whole series of groups out of the progressive era that because they were national federations uh, became stronger uh, at the local level. And that the progressives, contrary to the conservative view, cared not just about some national oneness, as my friend Shambra likes to parody us, um, but they created a lot of vital local organizations. Indeed, they were obsessed with local government. And uh, you know, progressive tried to take over cities and towns, create municipal electrical systems kind of governed by the citizenry, and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, now, I think that uh, capitalism has, uh, capitalism, I'm sorry, see in there, that's a Freudian or a Randian slip. Conservatism <laughs> um, has partly been uh, dominated, I believe, I, I, I don't think the rise of political money is irrelevant to this. Um, I also believe our national business class has moved to the right of where it used to be. Um, business is not inherently reactionary. Business is part of America. There are in many, in, in the town I grew up in, the Chamber of Commerce was really important to us in, uh, you know, I may have disagreed with them at times on matters related to labor law, but they were vitally concerned with the health of their uh, communities. They wanted people working and making money because that's how the downtown businesses uh, thrived. I think um, American business has moved to the right of where it was in opposing uh, regulation more forcefully. Um, you know, perhaps one can fairly point to the difference between George Romney and Mitt uh, Romney uh, as uh, reflecting that change. There's a wonderful piece on George Romney's tragic 1968 campaign in New York, the new issue of New York Magazine, where you really uh, see that difference. And then obviously the popularity um, uh, of Ayn Rand, and I'll only, we're, we're on, uh, 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 Bill Buckley and I agree on certain issues, and one of them is uh, uh, disagreeing passionately with Ayn Rand. And whenever somebody tells me they love Rand, I always ask them, did you ever read her book, The Virtue of Selfishness? Uh, and that tells you a lot about Ayn Rand. I'll just <laughs> leave it at that and pray that I'm not assaulted by some Randian who said I was unfair to her, which I, perhaps I was, but I don't think so. Um, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Um, E.J., you, you talk about the healthy tension between individualism and community, and, and the secret of American success is balancing those, those two ideas, uh, elements, v virtues. But presumably, the point of balance will differ between our two major political parties and between conservatives and liberals operating as you would hope to see them. How would you, just in shorthand language, distinguish the balance that conservatives might arrive at in a very constructive, healthy way versus that which liberals, progressives, Democrats, call them whatever you like, would? I, you know, it's, I'm glad again you emphasize balance because I don't think any of us would want to live in an absolutely purely communitarian uh, society. And indeed, I argue that uh, one of the great fail, one of the greatest experiments in communitarianism in American history was prohibition, uh, and it failed. Uh, and it was an attempt, I mean, and it's worth remembering that a lot of the advocates of prohibition were progressive. It wasn't just very conservative people who advocated it. It were people who saw the damage liquor was doing to uh, the downtrodden and to uh, working class and poor families. These were progressive people who had a lot of other progressive uh, ideas. So it was a noble uh, quest, but it didn't work out uh, very well. And that, um, you know, I, I, I think it's important to underscore that liberals and progressives have always been vitally interested in individual uh, rights. Um, but they have not been interested in individual rights to the exclusion of the good of the community. Um, in the course of writing the book, and partly from reading my colleague Jonathan Rausch's work on gay marriage, uh, it occurred to me that gay marriage is in some ways the quintessentially American uh, movement. Uh, because um, I, liberals would tend to view it purely, uh, traditional liberals would tend to view it purely as an individual rights movement. 
Uh, whereas when I look at where the gay movement went, they went toward marriage and they went toward service in the military. They weren't just asking for an individual right. Uh, they were asking for an opportunity to join the broader community and to bear the responsibilities that came from membership in that broader uh, community. There were a lot of people in the gay community initially who didn't like the marriage movement because they thought it was giving in to certain more conservative uh, norms. And I thought service in the military was just uh, you know, so important to the progress of the gay community because they were saying, we are Americans, we want to serve equally with our fellow uh, Americans. Now, to go to your question, um, it seems to me the argument right now is do we believe in balance or not? Um, and I think older, you know, the conservatism of uh, not so long ago um, accepted a, a substantial role for the state, uh, as, uh, um, accepted that there were things we needed to do in common because we could not do them alone, uh, and we argued, um, we argued forcefully uh, about uh, where government stopped and where the local community uh, began. We argued forcefully over how progressive these public programs should be. We argued forcefully about how should we raise tax money. There are a lot of things to argue about. I am not for uh, a one-party state of balance. I love argument. I go out of business if argument went out of uh, business. Um, but I think that we have to operate within some consensual framework, a very broad uh, consensual framework, in order to make progress. Because if we don't figure out a, together a kind of the boundaries of the consensus, then we end up like we did last summer with the debt ceiling fight, where one side believes so strongly that the other side is outside the framework of what's good for the country, that it is better to risk uh, you know, the nation's credit and all the mess that would have come from defaulting than it is to give in uh, anywhere. If we are operating with a, in a consensus, we can have a fight over budgets about how much, uh, in order to restore long-term uh, reasonable balance, how much should cut out, come out of cutting programs, how much should come out of revenue, how should that revenue be raised. I might argue for more progressive taxes. My friend Bruce Bartlett, a conservative, would argue for more consumption taxes, and we could sort of work something up, but we'd be operating within broadly uh, a, a, a framework in which we would at least be speaking the same language. Right now, we have the politics of the Tower of Babel, I think, uh, and that just, even that doesn't work well in a democracy. Yeah. That leads uh, uh, seamlessly to my last question, which is a cue to you all to think about your questions, because you come uh, immediately uh, after this. Now let's carry that to the 2012 uh, presidential and you think and, there might be some interest in congressional in election elections. In this. <laughs> yeah, we could talk about 1912. <laughs> it's a great election, but it was. But <laughs> alas, Tom and so. I used to write about 1912 together. Back in the, <laughs> yes, our pre-Brookings days. So. Uh, I mean, I gather from what you've said that Paul Ryan's budget is outside that that framework in which we can actually engage in, in the kind of uh, debate and negotiation compromise that, that Mitt Romney's campaign as best we, and his agenda as best as we identify it at this stage before the convention and everything else is in many respects also outside that framework is, one, is that true? Is that what you believe? And two, do you think that that will be engaged in the campaign? And uh, should it be? So you should all know Tom is my colleague down the hall. And uh, <laughs> we agree so often that I, I find um, the, 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 some of you may remember this old Bob Dylan line, which went, no use in talking to you, same as talking to me. Uh, and I sometimes, so Tom knows how I'm going to answer uh, that question. Tom and I agree enough that we actually relish the moments when we disagree and exactly. try to dwell on them because they're <laughs> fun. Um, obviously, I do think that a proposal like the Ryan budget is outside the framework uh, uh, that I'm talking about. And I'd, I'd love to, I, I suspect Paul Ryan doesn't. And I suspect he would argue that, well, he still believes in some kind of government 
uh, support and that he is merely trimming, uh, trimming that back. But uh, it seems to me the implications over the long haul uh, is that uh, uh, the implications over the long haul are that um, you take uh, a series of um, federal programs that we have come to take for granted um, and render them uh, so unextensive that they cease to be the programs that they are uh, now. I mean, those cutbacks are very deep. And, um, but it also goes to the question of um, you know, what kind of society do we want to have? Uh, Brian famously talked about these uh, social welfare programs as a hammock. Uh, and uh, first of all, I don't see a whole lot of very, very poor Americans spending a whole lot of time on their hammocks. Uh, indeed, most poor Americans actually work uh, for a living. Um, and secondly, and it goes back to the argument I have with had with David Brooks, which is um, the implication is always um, that government programs necessarily create dependency. Um, and I actually believe government programs have often been crafted in our history to create independence. Uh, and whether you go back to the Homestead Act, which created a nation of uh, small landholders, or the GI Bill, um, which allowed uh, people who could never have gone to college to go to college and uh, to prosper on their own, and student loans, which we need to reform because we're going to create a nation of debtors if we don't uh, uh, get a handle on that. Uh, but student loans, when I was, you know, were essential, you know, scholarship and loans were essential to my ability uh, to go to college. Uh, or, um, you know, the Social Security survivors' benefits, which have allowed many families uh, to get through tough times and become self sufficient again. And so, um, you know, I believe that um, a common mutual support uh, is not aimed at creating personal dependency, it's our efforts uh, to help each other get a leg up. Uh, in the world, um, and it sees us as, if I may quote St. Paul, as being all part of one another. Um, and I do think that uh, the American communitarian tradition has uh, sort of uh, you know, two sets of roots. One is the small r Republican tradition that talked about self-government and the need to think of the whole and not simply ourselves, but also the uh, biblical uh, tradition. And actually, maybe I will close this by reading from John Winthrop, who gave a speech in 1630 that I suspect Rush Limbaugh would condemn as socialistic. Uh, and so I just want to find one of my favorite quotes in the book. Um, and, and it's worth noting that the Winthrop speech in which he said this um, is the city, uh, shine, uh, city on a Hill speech that Ronald Reagan uh, liked to quote. Um, and yet this is a one of the most com communitarian uh, pronouncements. 77 or 78? Yes, exactly. Or 98? Um, <laughs> let's see. 77 or 78. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hold you up. I should have oh, marked, no. marked this uh, page. Um, wait, I'm, I'm, the pages are stuck. I should have also taken an old, well-thumbed copy of the book. It was a speech called A Model of Christian yes. Charity. Um, and um, uh, John Winthrop said, we must delight in each other, make each other's conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our community as members of the same body. And uh, Bruce Springsteen just came out with a great song that I love uh, where the refrain is, wherever this flag is flown, we take care of our own. I think there is a direct line from John Winthrop in 1630 to Bruce Springsteen in 2012. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so happy that EJ invokes St. Paul and that we, it's a way of reminding us that this book is, is filled with discussions uh, of religion as well because it connects so much to the subject before us. Okay. Although for those who are here who aren't as obsessive about religion as I can be, it is not primarily a religious right. book. I've, I have written those before. That was before. the last book. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Sold out. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, sir. Please, uh, we have a mic we're going to bring to you. It will help us with uh, the webcast. Uh, please identify yourself and uh, pose your question to EJ. Hi, I'm Bob Proctor. I'm a student at Johns Hopkins University. I was what wondering. Do you study, could I ask? Oh, public policy. Oh. 
Uh, and my question was, how influential would you say the, uh, the Reagan administration was, uh, you know, saying things like government is the problem uh, in the rise of uh, the new wave of radical individualism? Uh, no, it's a good question, uh, the, because Reagan has a kind of ambiguous role in my account, um, because on the one hand, he clearly prepared the way uh, for, uh, for this, and that there's always been a radical individualist strain within American uh, conservatism. It goes back to uh, reaction to the uh, uh, New Deal. A, a woman called uh, Kim Phillips Fine, a great young historian, wrote a book called uh, Visible Hands, I think it was, or Invisible Hands, about the role of um, certain kinds of right-wing business groups in creating the, ideo the, the ideology that today is in many ways uh, the Tea Party ideology. Uh, and Ronald Reagan reflected a lot of that. But even Ronald Reagan, I think, ended up operating within the long American consensus. I've always loved the line that uh, um, Wagner's music is better than it sounds. Uh, and Reagan governed in a more moderate way than he spoke. Um, and that in the end, he didn't overturn uh, the New Deal, the core uh, New Deal programs. He was very alive to uh, the importance of the communitarian strain uh, in conservatism. If you remember the great speech he gave in 1980 at the Republican Convention, it was family, work, neighborhood, peace, and freedom. Uh, and um, one of the things I talk about in the book is what I see as sort of the last great project of the uh, more communitarian conservatives, which was uh, AEI's Mediating Structures Project, uh, uh, a little book by Peter Berger and Richard John Newhouse called To Empower People, uh, which I argue was the manifesto for the Reagan Democrat before the Reagan Democrat uh, existed. Um, so yes, Reagan had this in his rhetoric, but still was much more part of the balanced conservative tradition. Uh, and I think that uh, we moved beyond even where Reagan was. Reagan might have been this in the period he was giving speeches for GE in the 50s, but he didn't govern uh, that way. He governed, again, I don't want to pretend, uh, I know my conservative friends hate it when those of us who are liberal <laughs> quote Ronald Reagan for our purposes. Uh, and so I don't want to pretend I'm a Reagan supporter. Um, there were things, there were a bunch of things he did that I opposed in terms of shrinking the state in ways that I think were not constructive. But I still don't think he's gone as far as our conservative friends are, are going uh, now. That was an absolute model of question asking and answering. So let's continue with that. Yes, sir, on the ah. Yeah. Greg Squires, George Washington University. I'd like to ask you, given the number and range of people who benefit from government programs, given the changing demography of our country, and given Romney's insistence on demonstrating how out of touch he is, how do you explain the fact that the polls seem to show that if the election were held today, it's a toss-up? Well, 8% unemployment takes you a good uh, ways there. Um, but also, uh, you know, I am struck by the fact that when you hear conservatives, Republicans talk about cutting entitlement uh, programs, uh, they seem to want to hold harmless all, anyone who is now over 65 years old. Now, why is that? Well, uh, you know, partly for historical reasons, when people come to adulthood, that's a, that is part of the conservative base now. So they're not talking about, although Democrats will try very hard to argue that the cuts they propose will ultimately threaten those now over 65. The fact is they're staying away from those kind of cuts. And you know there are a lot of studies that show that uh, um, many Tea Party supporters are strongly opposed to government except for Medicare and Social Security, which they view as benefits they earned when they worked and not really part of government in the way that uh, programs for others uh, might be. And um, you know, one could argue, I would argue that I think there's a bit of a contradiction uh, there, uh, but we all live with contradictions and so I, I sort of accept that others uh, do. So, uh, you know, so I think that's part of it. And I think um, you know, part of it is uh, economic bad times and part of it is if John McCain could get 46% of the vote in 2008, which was about the worst election climate for a Republican uh, to be running in, exhaustion with the war, exhaustion with President Bush, the financial collapse, uh, and Sarah Palin on his ticket, by the way, um, he still got 46%. So we are divided right now. And I think it's very hard for either party to fall below something above 45%. Uh, my hunch 
is that the Obama base is just a little bigger than the Romney base when you, uh, you know, and that you're seeing that in the three or four percent differential uh, in the polls. But it is, the times are very bad in certain states. The one advantage Obama may have is that on the whole, the economies are better in the swing states than in the others. I asked an Obama person jokingly recently if their economic policy was designed to uh, make sure unemployment went down quicker in the swing states. And of course, the um, federal government doesn't have that power. <laughs> is someone from Oxbridge uh, here that has a question? All the way in the back. Do we have an Oxbridge contingent? We have many. Ah. Yes, a contingent. We papered the crowd with Oxbridge people. Yes, Hi, I'm uh, Jesse Kinnunen from uh, the University of Glasgow. Uh, well you were talking about the, uh, the balance between uh, individuals and uh, the community. So I would like to ask, is the concept of uh, the American dream solely linked to the individual? And would the greater emphasis of the community uh, threaten that ideal? Thank I, I love I, Glasgow is one of the great communitarian cities in the world, I think. <laughs> I actually campaigned, spent a day campaigning with Margot McDonald in a neighborhood in Glasgow called Govan, which you know, who's a fascinating Scottish nationalist, but that's for another day. <laughs> um, the um, MVP, um, I told you. <laughs> the, it, it's, it, my book is very much about arguing um, uh, a case for a particular, uh, uh, for a definition of the American tradition um, that uh, encompasses both individualism and community. And uh, let me just quote my friend Paul Begala, who wrote a very nice column on this book, which I was grateful for. And uh, I was talking to Paul about the book, and he said, you know, Paul spent a lot of time in Texas politics, and he said there are two speeches you can give in Texas, and both of them resonate. And he said, speech one is, we came down here, we were self-sufficient, we built our own farms, we took care of ourselves, and we prospered, and by God, everybody should be like that. You can also tell the story by saying, we came down here, and when we came down here, we came in covered wagons, and when we faced adversity, we circled the wagons, and we fought together, and when we moved into these communities, we built towns, and the first person we brought in was a teacher to teach all the kids so the community could advance themselves. Those are both deeply authentic American stories that contain pieces of our truth. Uh, and I think the American dream encompasses both of those stories. But thank you for the uh, question. Bill, yeah. This is one of the great scholars, by the way, of American religion and the Catholic Church, so it's a privilege to have you here. In, in uh, the 80 campaign, Reagan could not go to the Catholic bishops who were push, had pushed uh, Carter uh, to get Carter to consider an amendment to do away with Roe v. Wade. The bishop, uh, but Reagan knew if he went to the Catholic bishops, he'd get the abortion uh, opposition, but he would have to also work with them on uh, peace issues and uh, the, all the social justice issues that were in the bishop's package. So he went to, instead, the evangelicals. Now, it's quite clear that, in fact, um, Bill Brock negotiated with uh, Jerry Falwell at all. Uh, what did they, uh, the Republican Party need to do to get the evangelicals into the party? And, of course, and the package appeared to be, well, in the first place, they had to uh, rebuild our military because Carter had cut the military budget. And so they needed to rebuild the military to save us from the communists, 1980. Uh, and then they were looking for an anti-abortion position, and they were looking for positions on all the key committees. And it seems to me that's what they got in their package, and that we have paid for that ever since, because it seems to me their control is what led to uh, the polarization before Reagan's administration was over. I've been looking at votes, and Good. it seems to me yeah. that might be the picture. Egypt. Yeah, let me just, uh, that's, if there's a long conversation to be had about changes in the Catholic Church where um, the, I, 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 I'm a Catholic, and I think that one of the reasons I am so, have always been so interested in communitarian ideas is because I am, I think that Catholicism is at heart a deeply, has a deeply communitarian view of the social order. Um, and, um, and that I think from a Catholic communitarian um, point of view, 
uh, uh, you know, a good representative of that was Cardinal Bernard in way back in the 80s, who argued that there was a seamless garment that involved the protection of life from the moment of conception all the way to the moment of natural death, and not simply for the first nine months of, uh, of pregnancy. And um, I think there's been a movement, because of new appointments, if you will, a movement to the right among the Catholic bishops, where bishops who wrote a very progressive set of documents on war and peace and the economy back in the 80s would not write those kinds of documents uh, today. But let me just make one comment, if I could, off your um, question, which is I am fascinated by, uh, and I talk about this in the book, about um, uh, Christians um, who end up, uh, Christian conservatives who end up aligning essentially with radical individualists in politics, which strikes me as strange. Um, because if you look at the Christian tradition or the, uh, the Hebrew prophets, it seems totally at odds with a radical kind of uh, individualism. And it did occur to me that there are strains within um, a kind of American evangelicalism, which also affects Catholicism, um, that are individualistic in their emphasis on salvation. I came to the notion that there is a distinction between those who say, uh, I'm Christian because Jesus changed my life, and those who say, I'm Christian because Jesus changed the world. Now, there are people, like my friend Mike Gerson, who might argue both of those things. But Mike has a strong communitarian um, streak in him. Uh, but there is, and that if you look at our evangelical tradition, that is a real change. Because the evangelicals, William Jennings Bryan, one of the leading American fundamentalists, um, was also deeply progressive. He's the guy who really pulled the Democrat, began to pull the Democratic Party away from conservatism and toward uh, progressivism. But I think that a, uh, there was a kind of theological transformation toward a more purely individualistic approach uh, to salvation um, that allowed some uh, Christians on the, you know, the more Christian conservatives uh, to feel quite at home with a kind of uh, individualism. And I know it's more complicated than that, and it has to do with politics and alignments and who, which party ended up being pro-life and which ended up being pro-choice. But I think there is this interesting, it's something I want to think about more, but I explored some uh, uh, in the book. Good, thank you. Yes, right here, please. Hi, Lane Wyndham, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland. So EJ, I wanted to thank you so much for your note of um, hopefulness about young people and their uh, individuality and their uh, communitarianism. I also, it struck me that this generation is probably one of the first generations that won't do as well as their parents. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the growing income divide and economic insecurity and what that means for the health of our democracy. Uh, thank you. Um, the, I, I think that um, the, your question goes to a lot of things, but one of them is um, how do we argue about the Constitution? Um, one scholar who's also a friend whose work interests me greatly is uh, Willie Forbath, who teaches uh, law down at the University of Texas and has done actually a lot of work on labor. Um, and Willie makes a case, which I quote in the book, that um, originalists have been successful in the public argument, um, not just because it makes a certain intuitive sense that judges should do what the Constitution says, uh, which gets us sort of, which somehow pushes back on the problem that there are conflicting parts of the Constitution, conflicting values in the Constitution, all that. But it's not just that. He argues that the originalists also have a kind of traditionalist conception of what it means to be American, and that those of us on the progressive side who want to have an argument with them and want to sort of push back against what we see as the chains that the originalists want to place on us in our efforts to create a more just society, uh, have to have a different view of the Republican tradition that underlie the Constitution. And the founders clearly believed, and that this was a Jeffersonian as well as a Hamiltonian idea, uh, then in order to govern ourselves successfully in a democratic republic, republic being less democratic then than it is now, um, people needed certain capacities. They needed uh, a certain amount of income and wealth. Uh, they needed a certain standing in the community. They needed a certain amount of education so that if you want our great experiment to thrive, 
You cannot have a society of radical inequalities. You cannot have a society in which some are deprived of the sort of basic background needs to become a self-governing citizen. And so this becomes not simply about, um, and for me personally, this is a good enough argument that you want greater justice in the society and less equality, but it's not just about that. It's about what does it take to be a self-governing republic. Uh, and that's where I think, where I like to see those of us who are progressive take the argument uh, for equality because we will be something other than a fully effective self-governing republic if we let economic inequality get out of hand. And that's what we've always argued as Americans. It's what, uh, you know, it's what Jefferson argued, it's what Lincoln argued, and so that's where I'd like to take the argument. It's a, a sort of a, a commonwealth sort of argument in a way. Um, yeah, um, we're going to take a question here. I'm, I'm, go ahead, please. Mike is on its way. We could also, because at some I'll, point, I'll gather, a few, gather but, a few just to get. But we're doing well. We have yeah. 15 minutes left. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I don't want to miss anybody. Go ahead. So, so if, if the modern conservative movement, let's say it was born in the, in the post-war period, a galaxy of thinkers, William F. Buckley, uh, uh, Wil Wilmore Kendall, Frank Meyer, Irving Kristol in 75 with, with the public interest. It's a whole galaxy of people who, who actually launched an attack against liberals and liberalism precisely for what they see as its exaggerated individualism. So I want to ask you about the complexity. It is so fun to have somebody quote Wilmore Kendall. His name <laughs> does not come up often at the Brookings Institution, so bless you. I, yes. I love the history of American conservatism. So I was wondering what you thought about, about, about their attack against individualism as they saw exaggerated in, in, the, in the hands of, of post-war liberals. Well, I've always had, that's the strain of conservatism that I have a certain empathy, sympathy uh, for. Again, up to a point. I mean, I... Um, I actually got to give a lecture at a tribute to Bill Buckley, and I told him the whole thing was clearly stacked because it was all conservatives and me, and they knew that I had a kind of love affair with Bill Buckley going uh, way back. You know, my goal in life is to be about 5% of as effective for progressives as Bill Buckley was for, uh, uh, for conservatives. Um, and there were problems with that traditionalist view that were reflected in Buckley's early opposition to civil rights, which he later renounced. Um, and that the sort of the problem with, the commu with communitarian conservatism rooted in traditionalism um, is that some of the traditions are defective. Um, you know, racism uh, can be seen as rooted in a tradition that was defective, a rejection of the equality of men and women is rooted in a certain tradition that is defective. And so this is where I am a liberal and arguing with the, with the conservatives on the need that tradition, I value tradition and think it should not be overturned lightly, but it sometimes needs to be overturned. Um, where, I, you know, where I agree with them is that um, I don't think that um, our system, the welfare state itself, uh, can be defended purely in individualistic terms. It's why in the book I talk about the communitarian roots of the gay rights movement, the communitarian roots of the civil rights uh, movement. I mean, my, Dr. King was very much preaching about individual rights for African Americans, but he was also preaching about not only uh, transforming the African American community, but he was talking about transforming the entire country into what he liked to call the beloved uh, community. And so I do think that those of us who believe in individual liberty cannot depend solely on, a pu a purely on an individual rights uh, tradition. And that's where I end up with some sympathy. And Buckley, one of the last books Buckley wrote uh, was one of his most beautiful books, a book called Gratitude, uh, where he very much talked about the debts we owe uh, society uh, for the protection and opportunity that it is accorded to us. And uh, my, probably my favorite Buckley among Buckleys, other than the guy who was very funny and quippy, uh, is the Buckley of gratitude. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, well, I was signaling. Yes, please. There he is. <laughs> Hugh Grindstaff. Um, I was a conservative once, 
And uh, it's like an AA meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on my iPhone, I've got all the books I had about Conscious of a Conservative. And uh, I, I was a fan of Bill Buckley at one time. All this stuff. And then I got a little call from Uncle Sam saying, we need you in Vietnam. I became a more communitarian because that's a community you sort of have to depend upon. <clears throat> And uh, Amitai Etzioni, who is the Mr. Compar uh, communitarian. But nowadays, logic. When you have a president who has got us out of one war and who is getting us out of another war, who's trying to get benefits for veterans, but yet Romney leads in the uh, polls amongst veterans, banks, what <coughs> J.P. Morgan just did, it didn't involve US money, guaranteed money, but it involved investors' money. And those investors who lose their savings have to have a network to depend upon. So how, how can you say, how do we put logic back into American politics? Uh, we've probably asked that question since uh, 1787 or 1776. Uh, Incidentally, I, I don't know if I quoted at the beginning, my very, very favorite line on America is from Winston Churchill, who said Americans always do the right thing after first exhausting all of the other possibilities. <laughs> uh, so we eventually get there. And actually, Tocqueville talked about our capacity for self-correction as one of our greatest gifts as a country. So that's why I'm kind of congenitally hopeful about us. Uh, you know, the, the real problem is how long will the long run uh, be before we get there. Um, just a couple of things. People vote the way they vote for a lot of different reasons. And one of the problems with saying veterans are voting for Romney, uh, I have no reason to doubt that, that poll is accurate, um, but are they voting for Romney because they're veterans, or are they voting because they are disproportionately Southern, or are they voting because they are religious conservatives? In other words, I think, for example, um, a lot of evangelical Christians began voting Republican in 1964 because they were Southern conservatives who were opposed to the civil rights laws and liked Barry Goldwater. It had nothing directly to do with their being uh, evangelical Christians. And I think that, you know, certainly the officer corps in our military is drawn disproportionately from Republican groups in the country. I think that is beginning to change a little bit. Uh, I've been struck at how popular uh, my friend Rachel Maddow's book, Blink, is among uh, military folks. Uh, my sister, who served in the Navy JAG Corps, uh, said that she was struck that a lot of her friends, who are quite conservative, my sister, is, uh, uh, my sister is a moderately liberal Democrat, but she was in the minority among, uh, in the military, um, said that they are very taken by this because of their feelings about what's happened over the last uh, 10 years. So I think that may be changing. Um, but also, none of us votes purely on our economic interests. You know, I am fascinated by Tom Frank's work. I think Tom has a lot to teach us, uh, and he very kindly blurb blurred my book. Um, but I, I thought a lot about, you know, people who vote on grounds other than their immediate self-interest. Well, I live in a precinct in Bethesda, Maryland, that is exceedingly affluent and voted 80% for Barack Obama. Now, were we voting against our, and I would argue that in the long run, we are voting for our interests broadly understood. But my conservative friends would say, you've got to broadly understand it pretty broadly to vote Democratic if you live in a precinct that affluent. Uh, and so I think that people vote for a number of reasons, and they also define their interests uh, differently, and that for some people, uh, and again, I agree with uh, a, bunch, a lot of what Tom says about uh, you know, progressives being too allergic to populism. And I have a chapter on populism that's more sympathetic to the populists than, say, the Richard Hofstetter account. I find I hugely admire Hofstetter, uh, love him as a writer, wish I hope I, I, I try to emulate him in that way, but disagree with some of his conclusions. Um, you know, so I agree with Tom that, they, that progressives can be too allergic to uh, populism. Nonetheless, uh, I think that uh, there are perfectly good justifications for people voting 
what they see as their values and being more interested in that than in voting their economic interests as you and I might define them. Yeah. Now we're going to have a final round. I'm going to collect a number of brief questions. Come on up here, please. Uh, let's give uh, Gary uh, the first one. EJ, we got to take notes. Uh, oh, yes. Thank short you. questions. And, and we uh, got to get Peggy's had her hand up for a long time. Right. So Peggy's a faithful attender of our events <laughs> at Brookings. So. OK. OK, um, I'll do my best. Uh, Garrett Mitchell from the Mitchell Report. Uh, and I want to go back to Bob Dylan, uh, because you and Tom are sitting uh, on the, sharing the we stage. We remind you so much of Bob Dylan. Right. That's hey. why you want to. <laughs> You're sharing the stage, and it was about two weeks ago when you shared the stage and the roles were reversed. Uh, you describe your book as hopeful. Um, the, 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 move, the, the book that Tom and Norm have written, um, uh, it's even worse than it looks. Um, I, I would argue, Tom might not agree, that it's not so much a hopeful book as it is a we better get serious today book and here are uh, uh, X number of things that we might do uh, to, to resolve the, the uh, deep uh, mire that we are in. You may recall it was, uh, it was Susan Page at that, at that um, meeting who suggested that if they wrote a third, a sequel to The Broken Branch, and it's even worse than it looks, it would be Run for Your Lives. <laughs> so my question is, um, is your book, I, I'm interested since you say the Bob Dylan thing about, you know, I don't need to talk to you because it's like talking to me. Uh, I'm interested to know whether, knowing Tom, having read the book, uh, are you looking at, uh, are you looking at things uh, and arriving at conclusions that are similar uh, or, or or not so similar? I especially want to thank you for that uh, question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gary, yes, sir. My name is Stephen Short. There's a fair amount of babbling about American exceptionalism, but no one has ever said exactly what it means. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if you have could define it can, can you give a coherent definition, and is it a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, that's, that's fun. Yes. Hi, Peggy Ochowski. I'm with the Hispanic Outlook. Could you talk a little bit about the whole concept of citizenship in terms of both communi communitarianism and, and especially liberalism? I know Alan Wolf says it, citizen, it's, liberals have a real hard time with immigration because they believe in equality. and just by definition, immigrants, non-citizens, and citizens do have different rights. So could you talk about that? Thank you. Uh, just, uh, we'll, we'll gather, let's gather two more questions in the back. Uh, uh, Pete, yeah. Uh, thank you, Pete Chetley from Brookings. Could you clarify something, which is to what extent is communitarianism similar to federal government action? In other words, we tend to translate it's the federal government versus individualism, but maybe communitarianism is just focusing on local communities or small groups. Okay, and the final, over here, please. Yeah. EJ, you're going to get 30 seconds to answer each of these questions. But Hi, Bart Solvik from Oslo University. Yes. Uh, you touched on this notion that progressives need to go back to the Declaration, the Federalist Papers, etc. Uh, is this just to deny the conservatives or Republicans the sole uh, defenders of these values, or are progressives just out of good ideas? Uh, neither. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the question. Let me go um, backwards on that. And actually, they kind of link together backwards. Um, no, I, I went back. Uh, I don't think progressives are out of ideas. Uh, and I, I do think there's a real challenge to progressives, liberals, and social democrats in the global economy that we live in. And I do think there is a struggle going on uh, in parties of the center left broadly all over the world about what is, how do we deal with this new situation. Uh, so I don't see it so much as progressives being out of ideas as progressives not having fully figured out the right response. They have some notions, uh, but that, that it's a complicated new situation that they are struggling to sort out. 
Um, no, I went back to the beginning. Uh, I mean, you know, on the one hand, yes, I want to contest our friends on the right because their view of our history would render all of us who are progressive outside the American tradition. And I do not believe that's true. I didn't write this book to ransack our history to find support for what I am for now. I went through our history to see, uh, to see what it actually teaches us. My conclusion, which people are free to uh, dispute, is that um, they and we can find reasonable uh, support for both op claiming to operate within the broader American tradition. And I argue that the balances I describe are truer to our long tradition than how some, but not all on the right, would uh, see individual liberty as the sole, um, you know, uh, the sole uh, value uh, within our tradition. Um, on the citizenship question, it's, um, um, you know, Peggy has done a lot of work on immigration. And I'll just answer this way, Peggy, which is that um, one of the, because I believe citizenship is so important, I am very uneasy with any solution to the immigration problem that uh, would have us as a nation accept a large number of people who work here without citizenship. In other words, I believe our basic American notion that eventually everyone who is here becomes a citizen has saved us from a lot of trouble and is also the right idea because I don't think you can have a democratic republic unless the vast majority of your people um, share the same citizenship, share the same rights and responsibilities that go with that citizenship. So whenever I see well, let's just have a lot of guest workers and that'll solve the problem. I am very uneasy with that because I think that um, could seriously undermine the, what I see as core uh, commitments. Now that gets tricky because that means that I also believe that some path will eventually have to be found uh, for people who came here uh, illegally and that's where we begin to get into big ar arguments. But I think the rights of all of us are better protected if everyone eventually has a path uh, to uh, citizenship. Um, babbling about American exceptionalism, uh, the, um, I, I, have, um, I love American exceptionalism and I worry about it at the same time. I worry about it just because the, I think anyone who is uh, progressive or has spent time around the world, and that's how Obama got himself in trouble with the first half of his famous answer on this. Uh, anyone, any of us who spent time abroad know that um, uh, everyone loves their own uh, country loves their own tradition. And when you talk about American exceptionalism, it sounds like, well, we're trying to say that we are so different than everybody else that we either don't respect their tradition or somehow look down upon them from a lofty perch. And I've never liked people looking down on other people from a lofty perch, uh, um, even if they were all American exceptionalists. Um, on the other hand, uh, do I believe there is something exceptional about our particular history? Well, yes, I do. Uh, and you know, originally, by the way, if I understand the history right, American exceptionalism was, was originally come up with as a way to explain why there were no socialists uh, in America. And so, and I believe it was originated on the left way back when. I want to, I've been meaning, because I knew somebody would ask this, I've been meaning to recheck that um, history. But we were one of the earliest republics on an extensive uh, land mass. Uh, we were, um, I mean, you can argue about the Romans, but the, their notion of citizenship was more constrained. Um, we were, have the longest uh, surviving constitution uh, in the world. Uh, we are uh, unusual in the way in which we have drawn immigrants. More countries are becoming like that. But we kind of pioneered uh, a certain way of being. Um, so, and that, uh, so I, and, and there is a religious underpinning to American exceptionalism through our history, which we could, uh, we could argue about. So I do think there is something exceptional uh, about uh, our history. And I like to define that in terms of who we actually are and not in terms uh, that uh, look down on any other civilization. 
Um, you know, although again, in, in all candor, I'm sure there are, I, I do like and love the American tradition because I think it has the seeds of sort of equality, democracy, and community in it, which I think is a, uh, you know, a tradition to be proud of. Um, uh, hopeful uh, Tom and me. Um, um, we're, uh, Tom and I are chronically hopeful. Uh, somebody once called me a Feliciopath. Uh, and, um, and I think that, you know, Tom and I, I I'm going to speak for you, if I may. Please. Uh, and then you can dissent. Um, the, um, you know, I, I think both of us have a sense of alarm about where we are now. And while we are hopeful, neither of us, I hope, is insane. Uh, and that I do not believe we can continue down this path we're on now with this kind of argument, this kind of dysfunction, indefinitely. Uh, our hopefulness partly comes from the famous Herb Stein, the conservative economist, who once said that if things can't keep going on like they are now, they don't. Uh, and I do see us eventually getting to the point of correcting uh, for this. And as I say, I'm hopeful because I think we've been here before at various moments of our history and have managed to come out of it. And because, as uh, I was happy Lane uh, talked about it, um, because uh, I do think this new generation that's coming up uh, has some real insight into what it will take to pull us uh, back together. That is not an effort of a baby boomer saying, we messed it up, it's your responsibility. I just happen to think they are, if I may use the term, an exceptional generation. And they are, in some ways, the deus ex machina of my book. Uh, I thank you all very, very much for coming. EJ, just uh, uh, I want to say that his performance here, uh, filled with wit and wisdom, is is uh, even more extensively on display in his in his book. If my colleague Norm Ornstein were here, he would say, and it makes a great holiday gift. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Father's Day. E EJ will will go outside by the table for any of you who have not gotten your book signed. Uh, I'll thank, sign multiple thanks, to e <laughs> thanks to thanks to EJ and to all of you for coming. Thank you.